This is the Emergency Medical Minute, sponsored by Health One. Welcome back to the Emergency Medical Minute. We're privileged to have Adis Carrick, clinical pharmacist, with us here today. This will be the first in a series of interactive podcasts between ourselves and Adis and his pharmacy crew. We think that it's such an important perspective. We interact with pharmacists in a variety of ways. Our listeners come from kind of across the spectrum. Some of us are fortunate, like we are here at Swedish, to have a pharmacist in-house 24-7. And man, do they save my butt on a regular basis. Some of us have a pharmacist who is available by telephone consult, and some of us are out there without the benefit of a pharmacist at all. So I'm hopeful today to kind of touch on some rapid fire topics that are clinically relevant for our folks. Adis has a great and diverse background in pharmacy across multiple parts of the hospital. Thanks for being here, Deese. Can you give us a little bit of background of what you're doing clinically, how you got here? Absolutely. First of all, thank you guys so much for having me. It's uh, really an honor. You know, it's podcasts like your guys' that actually just gave me the courage to kind of start my own and just provide some free open access education. So thanks for having me on. But yeah, my, my journey to um, emergency medicine pharmacy was uh, a little bit convoluted. I graduated pharmacy school in 2012, and then I just worked as a basically what you would call a staff pharmacist at a hospital in Fargo, North Dakota for about four years. And I always had interest in doing more kind of clinical duties and working in the ICU was kind of fun. But the couple shifts that I would have in the ICU or in the ER at my first hospital, I just kind of realized that I didn't really know what I was doing because at that time I didn't have any formal residency training. So after four years of working as a staff pharmacist at that hospital, I actually went back and uh, completed a residency, did a first year residency in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and then went on to complete a second year focusing on critical care. And then after that, I kind of worked in the hospital in various settings. So surgical ICU, medical ICU, emergency room. And about a year ago, a full-time spot opened up in the ER. And that's actually currently where I'm working now. So I have a total of about eight years of experience and two years of residency and just shy of two years in emergency medicine and critical care here. Perfect. Tell us a little bit about your clinical site where you're working now. Absolutely. Yeah. So I work in a pretty large level one trauma center in St. Paul, which is, um, if you guys are familiar with the area, it's right next to Minneapolis. And we're a safety net hospital, have a fairly large ICU with at least 55 beds. We see a lot of admissions. Like I said, we have a surgical ICU, a medical ICU, a nationally recognized burn center, and a very well-run and, and a very nice ER. I know I'm kind of biased, but um, I think it's just a fantastic site, and I was really, really happy and, and really honored to be able to not only do two years of residency there, but also continue on and, and work there after residency. Perfect. How is it different from your initial site in Fargo? I've been to Fargo, full disclosure. Oh, yeah. Big fan. Big fan. Yeah, drove through on my way driving out here to, to Denver. Love it. Beautiful. But I imagine it's a little bit of a different clinical setting to where, where you are now. Totally. Yeah. And I mean, you know, the pharmacist there and, and obviously like the medical system there is, is very advanced. And it, it's just it was different for me personally, because like I said, at that time, you know, I, I didn't have a residency and, and now pharmacy residencies are, are growing exponentially. And I think I never really got to experience the true clinical side of where I worked in Fargo at Sanford. But I know that they, I mean, they do a fantastic job. And I think I think just working in the inner city here in like a larger city that is St. Paul is just totally different, as you can imagine, with just different patient populations. The traumas are different and kind of the people that you're interacting and working with are pretty different than I would say what, what Fargo was, but both good in their own respects. Sure, sure. And you've now kind of seen a big swath of the spectrum of practice and, and kudos to you for going back into residency. So I know you're a wealth of knowledge, you know, kind of in, in multiple settings, whether it's ED or, or crude care. I want to talk today just about kind of some of the most common things that you see ER docs or ER mid-levels ordering that you have to gently kind of change in the in the MAR and, and maybe give a, a gentle reminder of, hey, that's, that's not quite how that's ordered. Or that's not quite the indication <laughs> for that drug. Uh, Absolutely. I know I'm guilty of this. I, on a near daily basis, we've got some pharmacists here that we know each other, not only by name, but by voice and just, just by the phone number popping up because I'm, I'm constantly reaching out to them where they're gently reminding me. Any, any insights into that about what comes up to you off the top of your head? Yeah, and I think some of the biggest things that we see, and obviously we have an emergency medicine medical residency as well, so we spend a lot of time working with and educating the residents at my site. And I think, you know, one of the biggest things will just be antibiotics. 
and not only dosing, but which antibiotics to use in certain settings. What do the guidelines say? Are antibiotics even indicated in the scenario? And a lot of that will then veer off into, well, if you have an allergy to this antibiotic, which one can I use? Which one can't I use? And I think starting simply, one of the first ones that we always get, and I kind of almost consider us a kind of like a much smaller ID service uh, on certain days <laughs> in the ER, because I feel like, you know, 90% of the phone calls I make are, are regarding antibiotics and dosing. And so I think that's kind of a big one for us personally. Sure. Absolutely. Any, any classic kind of uh, overdosing, underdosing that you see that we can maybe pass on to our listeners? I've got some ideas. But <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I think the big one is just being super familiar with the new guidelines. I mean, especially community acquired pneumonia, right? So as I'm sure you're aware, the whole concept of a healthcare associated pneumonia has kind of gone out the window. So we have a lot of patients that come in, for example, from nursing homes that have mild pneumonias that people want to put on, for example, vancozosin. Yep. Well, the new yep. guidelines say that really there is no increased risk of having these multi-drug resistant organisms if you're just living in a long-term care facility or a nursing home. Two biggest factors for developing these types of pneumonias with multi-drug resistant bacteria are actually being admitted in a hospital within the last three months and then also receiving IV antibiotics. So the first things I'll do is I'll kind of open up that patient's chart and if they have been admitted to a hospital but have not received IV antibiotics, I just have the provider switch it to like a ceftriaxone and then azithromycin or doxycycline for that atypical coverage, which I think is just kind of going to be a really hard thing for people to catch on to. It is. It is. <laughs> you know, historically, you know, if the patient came from a nursing home or a long-term care facility, I mean, we kind of did vancozosin for all these people and we're now seeing that that is totally unnecessary. Sure. And trying to, the pendulum swing a little bit back towards antibiotic stewardship as opposed to empiric broad spectrum, you know, without much clinical benefit. Exactly. I mean, if the patient's in, in severe sepsis or septic shock, then, you know, obviously there's different clinical things that go into that decision and maybe vancozosin is appropriate, but I'd say a large majority of the time, these are pretty stable patients that have mild pneumonias that definitely do not need such broad coverage. And I think the things that we learn from these patients being admitted from the ER and going up to the ICU is the pharmacist or the team up in the ICU will like immediately de-escalate those antibiotics. Right, right. <laughs> so, so we get a lot of slack. So sometimes I'll go up to the ICU and they'll say like, why did you guys give this patient vancomycin and zosin, you know, and down in the ER, like they're totally stable. And it's just one of those things. I mean, that obviously in the ER, we don't have the benefit of knowing the full history a or lot of the time. trajectory, sure. Or trajectory, sure. exactly. So I always, you know, try to try to back up my ER colleagues for, <laughs> for, for giving those broad spectrum agents every once in a while. But, but sometimes we do get caught where we were like, yeah, we probably didn't need to go that broad. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that is so true. I know I can I can personally attest to having done the same. But to your point, I mean, I think a lot of emergency physicians training. I mean, mine is relatively recent. I mean, I've graduated residency in the last five years, and right. it wasn't it, that was a that was a rule. That wasn't a suggestion. That was a rule, right? Yeah. And I think that's a major change of practice for us. Absolutely. When we do dose Vank, once and for all, what is the initial loading dose of vancomycin? <laughs> <laughs> so what we do at my site is we do twenty five mg per kilo based off of an actual body weight, and we max that out at two grams. Yep. We do have a newer protocol that allows us to give up to 2,500 milligrams, which I just have not done yet. <laughs> I think most patients get a dose of about two grams, and, and that's kind of where we max it out at. Perfect. Perfect. That was asking for a friend. No, <laughs> it's got to be 25 mg per kilo. I mean, that's what usually the loading doses that we see in my, in my site. Yeah, same. Same. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Well, perfect. Well, antibiotics are certainly a, a major topic. We'll touch on that here, and then I think we'll probably circle back to that in a uh, in a future episode. Any other topics off the top of your head that you see we us constantly needing you to help us out with? Yeah. I mean, I think a big one that always just spurs some discussion in my site is sedation. You know, post intubation sedation, and I guess a lot of this has changed now in the COVID era. I guess before COVID, what we were really pushing in our ICUs and in our ER was, you know, you intubate these patients and depending on how agitated they are, obviously it's a clinical decision made by the provider. But a lot of these patients can get away with just, you know, PRN dosing of fentanyl, right? So you intubate a patient that's otherwise healthy, decent lung mechanics, they can probably get away with, you know, 25 to 50 micrograms of fentanyl every 30 minutes for sedation. Mm -hmm. And I know the nurses are probably going to kill me for saying that because <laughs> I understand that it's annoying to go to your Pixis or Acidos or whatever machines you have and pull a dose out every 15 to 20 minutes. But we created this order panel that actually started in the ICU and kind of trickled down to the ER that I was actually a part of. It's called ICER. So basically what we're looking at is if we give these patients less sedation and 
stick with PRN dosing versus continuous infusions? Can we get them out of the ICU quicker? Mm -hmm. Can we improve outcomes, which a lot of studies have already shown that we can. So I would say, you know, starting with PRN dosing of your dilaudid or your fentanyl in patients whom you think will tolerate it. But like I said, that's kind of changed now, right? In the COVID era, we don't want the nurses to go in and out of the rooms all the time. So that's right. we've been starting more continuous infusions in the ER kind of as a rule. These patients get intubated and I'm putting in orders for a fentanyl or dilaudid drip almost right away. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I kind of maybe will recircle back to that maybe in like a year or two when this is all kind of <laughs> hopefully over and, and controlled sure. by then. But I would say, you know, sticking with, if you can, if you have a COVID negative patient, just PRN dosing of, of fentanyl or, or dilaudid and seeing how they do. And if the nurses are really annoyed and patients, you know, bucking the vent and not at a rascal that you would like, maybe then try to start that continuous infusion. Okay. Okay. What type of metrics were you seeing improved? Was it ICU length of stay, ventilator days? What were you seeing with the PRN dosing protocol you had? All of them, yeah. So there's actually just a plethora of studies that actually are cited very heavily in the pain, agitation, delirium guidelines. Basically, they're, they're saying um, shorter lengths of stay, less days on mechanical ventilators. And I think there's even some trends in even mortality, if I'm not mistaken, but I'd have to check that. Our own internal study that we hopefully plan to publish one day is looking at specifically ventilator days, lengths of ICU stay. And I think there's some more mortality and morbidity outcomes as well. Mm hmm Understood. Yeah, I yeah. think uh, it's a big component of the, the question of ICU delirium in, in these COVID patients, right? I mean, I think anecdotally, we're seeing, and there's some literature based for this too, about prolonged periods of delirium, both on mechanical ventilation and after there's these kind of exacerbated kind of ICU delirium stays. And I wonder if that's related to changing sedation protocols. It certainly, is, it's one of many possible components, certainly. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think what we've learned I think one of the biggest things that we've we've learned throughout the years is just how bad continuous infusions of benzodiazepines are, which I'm sure you're aware. Mm -hmm. Obviously, propofol and Presidex are, are a little bit better, but I mean, that whole concept of A1 or analgesia first sedation, I think is, is really taking off. And I think our patients are doing much better now that those guidelines are, are heavily focusing on avoiding benzodiazepine agents. Absolutely. I'd say that's probably the most prominent thing I've seen in the last five years is, I can't remember the last time I ordered a Versed drip. Yeah. Right. I mean, and there's good, good evidence for that. Well, that's, that's a, so that's a great topic. And then uh, I was thinking brief review of kind of anticoagulation reversal, the current state of that. What are you guys doing, especially for the direct oral anticoagulants? Anything? Yeah. So, right. That's, that's the, that's the tough one. So we, we actually do not even carry uh, Andexa or Andexin at Alpha. And that was kind of a, a system wide decision that we made. And I think if, if you just look at the data and if you look at the cost of, you know, like a high dose index, I think is upward of $80,000 for the full dose regimen mm -hmm. compared to like a case centra, which I believe depending on your site and, and how many units you're giving, I think caps out at about $8,000 or, or somewhere around there. Yep. Yep. And the, the outcomes just aren't there yet. I mean, from what I know, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there's just that one study that looked at Basically, it didn't really look at clinical outcomes. It just looked at control of bleeding and, and hemorrhage expansion and things like that. But they kind of weeded out the sickest patients. And I think it, just looking at the data that we have now, I, I think Case Centra is still the way to go. And I think, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the MCRIT blog. You know, they, they've posted a couple articles and a couple thoughts on that, which I agree with wholeheartedly. Yep. So I think now with the DOAX, I, I think Case Centra is the best option. I agree. That's our, that's our facilities policy as well. We Good. did a, a joint journal club with ourselves, trauma ICU, medical ICU, and I think we all came to the same agreement. Yeah. Irrespective of indication, it just isn't, it isn't there yet. Exactly. It isn't there yet. And, and I think that kind of segues us into another topic of just the case central use in general. So I actually sit on a board that reviews every single case central administration in the hospital. And then we get together with our ER colleagues, neurosurgeons and, and ICU colleagues, and we look at each case and try to figure out whether or not even case central was indicated in that scenario. So the big ones that we've actually stopped using case central for would be like operative oozing in the OR, which okay. I guess I didn't even know was a thing, but we were seeing a lot of a lot of people use it in the OR. We've there may be one or two surgeons who listen to this podcast, <laughs> so, <laughs> just in case perfect. they are. Yes, yeah, yes. perfect. Hey, if perfect. they have any data, I'm, I'm all ears. But we, we we have a bunch of surgeons on that panel who also agree that it probably isn't indicated in that scenario. Great. And then we see a lot of reversal with case central for patients that have elevated INRs in the setting of like liver disease and cirrhosis, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which also is kind of a con controversial topic, but we've kind of jumped on the train of this is probably not indicated in the scenario either. Got it. Do you have any caveats for active bleeding, whether it's active GI bleeding or, or other? 
in that case for those patients with known hepatic dysfunction, INR, you know, pick whatever parameters yeah. you want, but that they have active variceal bleeding and or hemodynamic instability, is there any trigger that then kicks you into back into the K-Centra pathway to give that? Or is it just kind of a hard, we don't use INR as a mediator for deciding whether or not we're going to use K-Centra in liver patients? Yeah, great question. I mean, and th- that's a tough one. I mean, it's definitely, totally. it's definitely, we don't have an answer to that, to be clear, to be I'm not asking you because I know the answer. I'm asking you because we we're looking for the same answer that you are. <laughs> I, I think the big one is the hemodynamic instability. I guess, you know, we do have some cases that come through where people have used K-Centra in similar scenarios where we kind of are like, well, I guess it's not technically indicated, but this patient's blood pressures were in the 60s. He's getting massive transfusion protocols. We're giving TXA and all these other things. And mm-hmm. K-Centra was kind of a last ditch effort in which scenario we kind of just leave that one as kind of like an unknown and just kind of follow the trends of usage in that scenario. Sure. So I guess I wouldn't necessarily say that it's contraindicated or or wrong to do that. I think we just have to know that the risks of clotting are very real. Mm -hmm. But I guess if you have a crashing patient that's about to pass away, you kind of do what you can for them. So the K in case interest stands for kitchen sink. That's right. There you go. (laughs) Good way to think of it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Well, can you plug your podcast for us? I, I want to make sure that we get some good airtime for that. I want to hear about what you're doing with podcasting because I, I think there's a really exciting opportunity for collaboration between our two podcasts. What are you up to? Yeah, I'm very excited. Yeah, thanks again. So my podcast is called ERRX, and it's basically a podcast that's focused on the appropriate and optimal use of medications in the ER and ICU setting. And this all kind of started, obviously, I'm a big fan of podcasts, and I listen to a lot of them. And I just felt like I had some decent information to share that I didn't really have anyone to share with. <laughs> and it just so happened that during this COVID era, um, I ended up being on a, like a one week furlough. And there was a time there where I was quarantined because I came into contact with a, with a positive ER resident, actually. Mm. And so I was trying to figure out ways to to fill my time. And, you know, I started this podcast in late May. And just the goal is basically kind of to provide education similar to what you guys do. I'm, you know, free open access medicine and, and topics on things that I think that providers, pharmacists and nurses even can just find very helpful when they're taking care of these really sick patients. Well, wonderful. We will have links to the EDRX podcast. Excited for you to join the podcasting space. Uh, it's it's a fun space as someone who's relatively new to it, but I, I am enjoying it. I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to collaborate. I think the perspective of the pharmacists in the emergency department is one that's kind of underreported and uh, certainly, and I think under underappreciated. So I do primarily nights. And uh, I okay. tell you, man, in the middle of the night when I've, I cannot remember the, the dosing of something, or I'm basically approaching on delirium myself at the end of a night shift, <laughs> uh, you know, I think uh, having Having, having a pharmacist there with me is, is just is so invaluable. So I look forward to having a continued collaboration with you in, in ways that benefit both of our podcasts and our and most importantly, our listeners. I think today was a great starting point about touching on some really clinically relevant information that our practitioners can put to use. And I think there's there's more to come. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Yeah. Happy to be here. Thank you guys so much for having me. It's, it's really an honor. I'm a big fan of your guys' podcast. We are on a quest to provide the world with free medical education. Please help us out by rating us on iTunes, following us on social media, and subscribing to our newsletter at emergencymedicalminute.com.